Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this Thursday, December 7th in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Singer, actress, and content creator Lauren Mayhew is here to look back at her time playing Mara Lewis on Guiding Light and fill us in on what it's been like touring the U.S., South Africa, Belgium, Holland, Dubai, and Tokyo to enthusiastic crowds over the years. Lauren is currently a series regular in the DreamWorks hit animated series Trollstopia on Hulu and Peacock, where she plays Val Thundershock. She has played this role for seven seasons. She has also starred in Showtime's Dexter, CSI, Law and Order, Fox's 911, one of my favorites, NBC's The Blacklist, and most recently, CBS's FBI Most Wanted. In addition to her acting career, Lauren was previously signed to Epic Sony and toured, as I mentioned, as an opening act with Britney Spears, Katy Perry, Destiny's Child, and opened for Aerosmith at the Super Bowl. She is an accomplished songwriter who has licensed over 200 original songs to film, TV, and commercials. She has also toured the globe as the ring announcer and national anthem singer for WWE's SmackDown. It is my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Lauren Mayhew. Hey, Lauren. Oh, did I lose you? Lauren, Lauren, Lauren. Uh-oh. I think I lost Lauren. Hello, hello. She'll be back. How's everybody's Thursday going? I hope it's going well. Thank you for being here. That's fun to start right out of the gate with some internet troubles. I'm sure she'll be back. Uh, so give us just a second to get things situated. Hi, Charlotte. There she is. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi issues. I have no idea what happened. My computer just went black. I was like, Yeah, I am. I, I I came back, I introduced you, and I, I have no idea. Um, so but anyway, I said oh please welcome to the locker room, Lauren Mayhew. <laughs> Well, that's part of the beauty of live, right? All of these things happen in real time. So what can you do? <laughs> it, it, You know, at the beginning, when I first started hosting it at the beginning of the pandemic, it would totally freak me out. But I, I basically started my career in live television. Yeah. I, I was a page at Regis and Kathy Lee decades ago. So, wow. Um, you know, like you said, anything, anything can happen. Anything it's been a long time. I don't even know if you remember me. You were a kid when you were on Guiding Light. Um, so thank you so much for being here. My God, you have done such amazing stuff. You have had such a varied career. Um, you grew up in Tampa, started That's performing cool. at an early age at the Tampa Bay Performing Arts Center, now called Straz. What drew you to performing? You know, ever since I can remember, I always loved uh, singing and acting. I did start out in theater. Um, and then because Tampa is so close to Orlando, there was a lot of Nickelodeon and WB shows that filmed there and a lot of national commercials that filmed in Florida. So actually. Oh no. Um, one of my childhood friends who was also um, a guy like Britney Snow. Britney Snow. Oh. Um, oh, wait, am I frozen? No, nope, you're, you're good. I think it's going. Yeah, you, I, I, I recalled that you and Britney were friends growing up. Um, this is the worst of all times. I feel like my Wi-Fi is, I don't know what is happening right now. Are you, are you near your Wi-Fi? Okay, am I no? <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Okay, so we're back. Okay. So, uh, um, we are having some internet trouble for sure.
Sorry, folks. It happens when we're relying on the internet. Maybe she's going closer to the router. Oh, sorry, folks. Yeah, I don't know. Are we supposed to get snow this weekend? We might be getting snow up east. We are frozen on, on Lauren wherever she... Let's see what happens. She will be back. Um, you know, it, it's how we rely on the internet these days. So my apologies to all. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Benjamin. Hi, Dinah. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I appreciate it. Let's see what happens uh, if Lauren returns. <laughs> I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Any questions while we're at it? <laughs> Grumlins. <laughs> I love that. The Grumlins are causing all the issues for sure. Let's see if... Uh... I feel bad for her because she's probably stressing. I'm just sitting here talking to all of you. So we'll see what happens. Any questions, folks? Um, I hope she's returning. Maybe she's rebooting her internet. Who knows? Um, that's right. She is extremely talented. My God, she's done a lot for somebody so young. She has. People are probably tuning into the locker room right now and saying, where's the guest? <laughs> um, I'm not the guest. Anyway, um, Tonight's the first night of Hanukkah, so to anybody who's celebrating, happy Hanukkah. Hopefully, Lauren will return. I don't know if she was going down the stairs. I hope she didn't fall. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not laughing at that, I hope. Um, but anyway, so any questions? We lost the incredibly talented Neil Simon yesterday at 101. My God, what a life well lived. We could all take a lesson from that genius of a man. Some of the greatest television series ever created by Neil. Norman Lear, did I say <laughs> by Norman Lear? Um, I don't know what happened. I'm hoping Lauren returns. Lauren, Lauren. <laughs> any big plans for the weekend, any of you folks? Oh, we're just sitting here, live TV, live internet, live YouTube, me talking to no one, to all of you. Um, I hope you're out there. I hope you're listening. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Lauren Mayhew, I hope you're returning. There she is. Oh my goodness gracious. 
I don't even know what to say. I'm so sorry. I literally came to my neighbor's house to get Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> I that no no worries. You were in the middle oh of talking about growing up with Britney Snow, which I was yeah. Gonna ask so basically, about. we I started going on auditions uh, with her and her mom and my mom just because we thought it would be a fun thing to go over to Orlando. And from there, I actually started booking some national commercials. I booked some work for some WB shows and on Nickelodeon. And um, yeah, it just kind of, I caught the bug, I guess, if you will. And it kept kind of going from there. I ended up getting uh, the part on Guiding Light because I was going back and forth from Tampa to New York. I won this um, Wilhelmina modeling contest when I was a kid. And the final stage was in New York City. And that's where I actually got my agent and my manager and um, yeah, started going out and auditions in New York and spending the summers out there with my family. And when Guiding what Light did, happened- What did that contest- uh, entail? Like, what did you have to do to win? So, um, you first, uh, entered in your state, I believe this was so long ago. Now I'm trying to remember. And I was a kid. Um, and then once you, if you won in your state, then it was like, went to the region. And then if you won that, then everyone from the different regions congregated in New York and you would either have like a talent or a skill that you would do. Um, but there was just, a, it was kind of like a, I guess whoever like one got a Wilhelmina modeling contract, which I didn't end up winning the whole thing, but I still ended up signing with Wilhelmina when I was a kid anyway. Um, so you could still get signed with them even if you didn't win the overall uh, contest. But um, yeah, it kind of kickstarted everything with meeting my my agent and manager there. Wow. what What's your earliest memory of singing? Oh, wow. Um probably making up dances and singing at my house with my sister or with my friends. We used to make these extravagant um, singing and dance routines that we'd film and put on shows for our parents. <laughs> so I guess, you know, practicing from an early age, if you will. But um, yeah, I just have such good memories of that. I also have good memories of my dad used to have this crazy conversion van with twinkle lights and stuff like that. And I remember he had this Disney CD that he used to play and he'd sing along like Arabian Nights. And I remember I knew every song on that CD, we would just be belting it um, all together. <laughs> just cheesy uh, family stuff from when I was a kid on long drives. <laughs> Arabian Nights from Aladdin? Yes, that's the one. <laughs> I, worked on, I, I worked on that movie. You did? Amazing. Yeah. Well, my dad does a great rendition if they ever bring it back. <laughs> I, I was doing PR for Disney at that time. Pretty, I lucky, love that. Pretty, pretty lucky kid. Pretty lucky kid I was. Um, that's incredible. But at the age of eight, you were in 64 episodes of a PBS series called The Reppies. Tell us what The Reppies were and what you remember about that experience. So The Reppies was a kid show and it basically was a dinosaur rock band. So there were some uh, characters that were dinosaurs and some characters that were real human beings. I was a real human being. And the premise of the show is that my uncle uh, managed the rock band, the dinosaurs. <laughs> Which Genius. sounds crazy saying it now, but you know, it was a kid show. And yeah. um, it was really cool because it um, incorporated music plus acting. So it was a really cool way for me to bring together the two different worlds of acting and music and be able to do both. So um, whatever songs were in those episodes, you know, I'd record previously in the studio. And uh, so parts of the episodes were kind of like shooting a music video, which was really fun and different. That's wild. Who yeah. are some of your musical, uh, you know, icons growing up? Who did you listen to? Wow. Um, <clears throat> So I feel like when I was a preteen and teenager, alternative rock was really big. And I remember listening to like Blink-182 and Good Charlotte and bands like that. Um, obviously, you know, I was in a girl band and grew up in the boy band days. So I definitely listened to all of them. Um, loved Did Michael you have Jackson. a particular favorite? What? Did you have a particular boy band favorite? Mm, I mean, that's hard. Those are fighting words right there because... <laughs> I think actually when I was super young, I liked Backstreet most. And then I got to tour with NSYNC and then that kind of swayed me. I mean, honestly, they're so, for both being boy bands, they have very different styles and very different energies. Um, if you've seen them live and listened to their music and stuff. So I don't know, they're both they're they're both great. And and we had uh, 98 Degrees uh, performed on As the World Turns in New York. Yeah, amazing. That's awesome. We got to tour with them as well. They're great as well. Yeah. 
That's that's wild. What do you remember about your audition for Guiding Light? So I remember um, going in. And, and you were there before Brittany arrived. Do I have that right? Yes. Or was she? You were, right? Yeah. Yes. I looked at the dates and I thought you arrived before she did. Yeah. So essentially what happened, I remember I did my audition and um, I was, I think, flying home that day. And before I even got home um, back to Florida, I had had a, I guess, you know, my manager had called my mom and left her a voicemail. So when we landed, I already, like, I had already known that I had gotten it. It was literally that quick, which, you know, sometimes projects can turn around quickly, but usually not same day quick. Um, and that was like a couple hours later. So um, that was pretty wow. amazing to, you know, land Do you on remember the plane. Who you met just with? Get... Huh? Do you remember who you met with? Like for the audition at all? Oh man, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm yeah. trying to think if it was 98, it was probably Glenn Daniels who was the casting director and then Melanie, uh, and I'm not sure what her name was at the time because I think she's since married. Melanie probably was the assistant casting director. You know, I think as an actor, when you go in, it's not like I knew I was going to get it, right? So I think that when I go in, I kind of just try to focus on that. And then I try to just leave it behind as much as I can, because, you know, for all the things that you see an actor book, there are 10 million more that they didn't, right? So sometimes it's hard um, if you hold on to something too tightly. So, you know, I've learned from a young age to try to just do your best and then move forward um, and try not to hang on to it. Now that's easier said than done. It's always a work in progress. <laughs> and some projects, you know, you become more attached to than others. So, you know, you want them more, but, um, yeah, I think that's probably why I have a tendency to forget that sort of stuff because it's on purpose, if you will. <laughs> How cool was it for you when, when Brittany showed up? I mean, it must've been so fun for both of you. It was such a blast. Honestly, that wasn't even the only project we got to work together on. We also did when she was on American Dreams as uh, a series regular and then the star of the show. Yeah. Um, I actually got to do, I can't remember if it was three or four episodes, but a three or four episode arc um, on the show as well. And um, so we've gotten to work together on a couple different projects, which is pretty neat. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, to, yeah. to be from the same area, end up on the same She literally show. lives like five minutes from where I was <laughs> born and raised. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. Do you remember your first day showing up at Guiding Light? Because that that was, uh, I mean, you did the repis at eight, and then, I mean, that was. I don't know if I remember my first day, but I definitely remember like what it was like. It was definitely more structured than any, than any other film set I'd been on. You know, typically, you know, with film or TV, every day is different. You know, maybe you come in for one scene, maybe you come in for multiple. It, it can be the time that you come in is very different. I remember that soaps were much more structured where, you know, I, I basically was in around 8 a.m. each day. Um, we do a walkthrough um, where they'd kind of block the cameras. You'd run through the script. You'd ask any questions. Um, you know, the director could give you any, you know, uh, tips or, um, you know, direction. And then uh, you'd go through hair and makeup. You'd have lunch and then you'd shoot in the afternoon and be done usually around four o'clock unless it was like a really big day and there was, you know, huge scenes with a ton of people and then maybe it was longer. Um, so that was a really interesting um, experience just because it was so different than the rest of the the shows and films that I'd been on previously. Uh, Kim Zimmer, Robert Newman played your mother and father. Do you remember anything about them? They were always so kind and so welcoming. I have nothing but phenomenal things to say about both of them. Um, they made it really easy. I think, you know, coming into a, a a soap opera or any show where, you know, the rest of the cast and crew has been together for so long. Sometimes that can be daunting. You can feel kind of like an outsider. It's also, you know, they're playing my mom and dad. That's a very close relationship. And so uh, you want that to obviously translate on screen. And I think that they did a really great job of making me feel so welcome so that I could, um, you know, so they could do their job and I could do mine. And it was honestly like a, a really great work environment. Everyone was really kind to me. Um. What, what do you think you learned there that you took everywhere else after? Probably one of the biggest things is how to um, memorize copy. Because on a soap, the turnaround time is so much quicker. You're doing so much copy in a day. And so now, I don't know, it's kind of just a, a, like a muscle, just like anything else. Like, you know, I guess if somebody works out all the time, you know, they can get better and better at it or whatever. It, this is also a muscle in that same sort of sense where... I can look at even like an eight page script and after reading it through a couple times, pretty much have it memorized. Maybe not exactly word for word, but that was one thing that was soaps. They're not too 
uh, like picky about. If you, you know, change a word here and there, they're not really, as long as you kind of get like the main gist and also kind of, I think it's important to end it similarly each line so that somebody else knows that that's their cue or that's, you know, um, when they're supposed to, you know, uh, start speaking. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a very, very helpful um, tool. I think that I've been able to utilize for the rest of, you know, my acting projects. I, I'm sure it's got to help. It, it's, and you know, when you walk in somewhere, um, anything from, you know, story that stands out that you remember? So I think at the time, I mean, it, all of the, all of the storylines are so insane, but I think this, I think Kim Zimmer actually won uh, an award during the time that I was there, because I think that's when she, if I remember correctly, I think it's when she was playing the two different. Um, she was cloned. Yes, she was cloned. And so I, thought, works I, I had a feeling that that was during the clone. Yeah. yeah. And so that was a really crazy storyline. And I just remember being in awe of her because she was in everything because she was playing two people. So I feel like, you know, she'd be playing one version of herself with me and then another version of herself with another character. And I'm like, wow, like, and that went on for, oh my gosh, that storyline went on for forever. <laughs> so she had to do that for a long time, but she definitely deserved, um, you know, all the, all the accolades that came to her. Yeah. And I, I can imagine at a young age watching someone like Kim do something like that, um, you know, must be an incredible. It was. Inc I was also incredible. impressed too with like how well she could tap into emotion I think that, you know, as a kid, you know, I was very lucky, like, you know, my parents were incredibly supportive and incredibly loving. And, you know, I didn't really, I had a very, like, amazing and so grateful to have had a, a really nice childhood. And I hadn't really gone through a lot of, like, trauma or struggle at that point in my life. And I feel that, like, even though there were certain things that felt very, very real for me as a kid that I think translated for me as a young actress, I think probably the hardest thing for me when I was a kid was getting to some of those emotions. Cause now, you know, as an actor, I feel like a lot of it is taking from your everyday life or taking from your own experiences and kind of applying, you know, what that would be for that character and, you know, figuring out those things that would get you to that place that that character is feeling. Um, so I remember watching her and being like, wow, like this is amazing how she draws and can just elicit this emotion so effortlessly. And so that was something that also stuck with me and, you know, for good and for bad, I obviously have gone through a lot more life now and now it's a tool that I can, <laughs> Um, but definitely I, bring out, I guess, for good and for worse. It obviously, it means I've been through some stuff in life, but yeah. haven't we all? But um, definitely made me a better actor because of it. But watching, you know, I mean, that's the amazing thing about getting any job at whatever age you are. If you spend the time watching the people in front of you, you, yeah. you know, it's hard not to take in what they're doing, you know, and Absolutely. learn. And what, what a great opportunity. And I, I remember... You know, I, I mean, my memory stinks, but I do remember when PYT came up and and you left to take yep. that. How did that opportunity was, come about? Yeah, so this was also crazy too because I was having this conversation with someone else the other day. It used to be, because Guiding Light was actually amazing and they were willing to keep um, my role open and not recast me for a pretty long period of time. They were like, listen, we'll work around you, like go off and do tour and then come back and just shoot when you can. But it's interesting because nowadays, you know, the film and music industry are very much so not only in awe of each other, but see the benefit of, you know, an actor or a singer being involved in both where they really, um, if anything, they're excited about that and push it, et cetera. At the time, at this time specifically, that was not the case. Sony 100% saw my acting as taking me away from what I really needed to be focusing on, which was touring and recording. I mean, and I was emancipated at 13 for PYT. So they could work and they did that so that they could work as adult hours as a child. So, um, you know, and I loved it. So it wasn't like I was complaining, you know, I think at all times, you know, my parents, my dad being a surgeon, my mom being a nurse, they were concerned, like, are you sure you want to do this? I feel like they were constantly questioning me being like, not in a bad way, but being like, are you sure, Lauren, you know, making sure that it was my choice, that it was something that I was still enjoying it, that I was still having fun. And, um, you know, I definitely was. So it, it was my choice. And I, and I love doing it. And their one thing was, as long as you do well in school, then we'll make sure that you're allowed to keep doing it. So, um, but I digress. Uh, what, what was the, oh, how the, P, how PYT. Yeah. How did about. it come about? Yeah. So actually I was in before. So when I was living in Florida, I was in this singing group that was kind of like a Mickey Mouse club 
um, sort of group, but we performed live um, different places all over Florida. And I met the PYT girls in this group. And then one of the girls came to rehearsal one day and she was like, Lauren, oh my gosh, you're not gonna believe this. And I think it was like Tiger Beat or something like that magazine. She's like, I found this article that says become a pop diva. I'm like, that's awesome. I wanna be a pop diva. <laughs> So then we asked our two besties, Tracing and Ashley, and we're like, hey, like, do you want to submit to this contest? Like, this sounds so fun. They were like, yes. So then we um, brought in the, the director of the group at the time, and we said, hey, do you have any original music or a recording studio where you know we can record? We want to submit this demo. So she helped us. And then before we had the opportunity to even send it in, because I think it was for Arista or something. I don't, I don't remember what label it was. But before we even had a chance to submit it, the director of the group of the sing the live performance singing group that was kind of like the Mickey Mouse Club had gotten a call um, from a label executive um, at Sony who was looking to sign like a young, uh, you know, up and coming, you know, girl group. And she was like, oh, I have the perfect girls for you. And so literally told them about us, sent us the demo that we had record that we had recorded for the contest. And then within, I think, less than 48 hours, they flew down to Orlando. We auditioned for them at the Peabody Hotel. I still like, I remember crazy details about this experience, which is so nuts because it was so long ago now. But they had us all sing together and dance. We put together like a routine. Then they had us each sing individually. Then David McPherson, who was the A&R at the time, I remember sat us down and gave us the most terrifying lecture about the music industry being like how hard it is and you have to really want it and all of these things and la la la. And it's not for the faint of heart. And I remember we were all like, Oh gosh. And when he left, we were like, did that even go well? We're like, I, I don't know. Were you just lectured us? We don't even know. And the next day they signed us. And within a month we were on tour with Britney Spears. It happened that fast. So from conception of let's be a pop diva, finding it in the magazine to being on tour with Britney Spears about a month and a half. Wow. Pretty crazy. I mean, that, I mean, how do you, you know, digest all of that in your brain you know you, you don't really you just keep going you're just like oh you know i mean i think you know at that point you know i wasn't like i wasn't new to entertainment necessarily and i wasn't new to performing because you know i'd already been doing tv like i'd done the repies at that point i'd done a bunch of commercials i'd done other guest stars um you know i'd been doing entertainment for a while i'd also been performing while not for fifty thousand person audiences like britney spears and stuff i was with that group performing you know, for big corporate events and for fairs and festivals for, you know, hundreds and maybe sometimes thousands of people. So I had been performing since I was five. So I think that, you know, there was never any fear. There was never any worry. And also they were my best friends. So it was like just getting up there with your best friends. We weren't, cause that was another thing that really made us, um, I think stand apart is that a lot of other groups at that time were very manufactured and put together. And I think sometimes you can feel that in the camaraderie where like, these girls and I, we had our own secret language that we talked in, you know, and all this other stuff. And we would have games that we would play while we were on stage, like to make it like interesting and change it up or just crazy stuff. I also ripped my pants in front of 50,000 people. And thank goodness that one of the moms off stage had a sweater so I could tie it around my waist because I mean, I would have just been showing my butt to all of, I think, I don't even remember where we were, maybe New Jersey or something. <laughs> but that's, that's terrifying when you're 13. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Uh, I did a high school variety show and one of, you know, we did a number and one of the guys ripped his uh, pants. I mean, to, to, when they tell you you're going on tour with Britney Spears, I mean, mind blowing. So at that point, blowing. by the way, though, she was big. I mean, she had done Hit Me Baby One More Time and that was blowing up, but she wasn't as big, like as iconic as she is now. This is when, this was still, I'd say on her rise. So it was a big deal. But um, it was it wouldn't have been like if somebody said she was still like she was still growing, I guess, is, is my point. Gotcha. So it was still yeah. really exciting. But I think even more exciting for us was when we got the opportunity to open up for NSYNC, because when we did that tour, they were at their height. And that was like, whoa, same thing with Super Bowl being able to do that. I mean, which still I think is such a bucket list item for most artists. And I can't believe that I did it at 16, which is nuts. Would you want that to do insane. it again? Oh my God. I mean, I hope I like, you know, I mean, I hope that, it, you know, that's the thing is that when you start as a child actor and a child musician and singer, you know, it's hard. You have to, as the industry changes and as entertainment changes, you have to constantly evolve and grow with it um, and, or be phased out, you know? So I think that, you know, something that I think any entertainer who's been in the industry forever is 
the concern to always remain relevant and remain, you know, feel like your your next best thing is still yet to come that you haven't, you know, done all of the coolest and best things that, you know, you're going to do in your career. So, you know, I think that mine has definitely changed in so many ways. Obviously, I'm still acting and singing, but the DJing, for example, is a brand new venture and that's opened up so many opportunities and doors and has been such a great way to not only travel around the world and see amazing places, but also um, perform my music as well. And um, yeah, I think that, you know, it's just, it's just interesting. If you would have told me when I was a kid that I would be a DJ right now, I'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, but what I, I do love is that you are open to other things and that, you know, I think closing yourself off to something prevents an opportunity that might just be lying in the, you know, lying in the wings. Um, how did the DJ, DJ role come about? So um, at the time I was living in LA and I had the opportunity to record some music with some, you know, influential DJs from Europe. And I was getting asked by them to come and perform with them, you know, for maybe like a song or two during their set, et cetera. And I would tour around with them and just be the singer that would come out for part of it just to add something extra to the performance value. And, um, but it kind of got to the point where, you know, I'm, I'm a go-getter sort of personality and I love to be, um, I like to take control, I guess, of my own destiny and of my own um, career. And I felt like at the time, as much as I, I love collaborating, I always have, but I always felt beholden to either a DJ or a guitarist or a band or somewhere else where I couldn't, you know, just go and sing by myself. I had to rely on other people. And that's great if they're, if you have a team that's super reliable, but if everyone has different goals and trajectories, et cetera, then it can kind of sometimes make you feel a little stuck that you're not able to do all the things that you're wanting to do because you're having to rely on someone else. So I decided um, to try to empower myself and to teach myself um, how to DJ so that I could, you know, be kind of, you know, so I could just go forth, you know, on my own and um, not be held back by that. And it was crazy at that time. And this is true. I could, you can't make this up. I was single at the time and I was on Bumble. And the, I go out on a date with this guy and he's super nice, but you know, I think we decided, okay, we're just friends. But when we got back to his house, we went on a bike ride. I saw that he had all this DJ equipment in his house. And I was like, oh, like I thought you worked in marketing. And he's like, oh, well back in Brazil, like, you know, I used to DJ and, you know, play events and all this other stuff. I was like, oh, he's like, why do you want to learn? And I was like, yes, actually. And so for some reason, this amazing human, um, you know, who became one of my really good friends, um, took it upon himself to like from the bare bones basics, teach me um, everything from like how to organize music, uh, what software to use, um, you know, and I would come over to his house using his equipment. And anytime that I'd mess something up, he'd be like, nope, do that again. No, that sucked. No, like try this, you know, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and then towards the end of it, I still had more to learn. And he thought so much of his tutelage that when he left to go on this like year long sabbatical, like around, you know, traveling around the world, living his best life. And he introduced me the day before he left to another person and said, Lauren, this is Peter. And Peter is going to help you finish learning everything you need to know so that you can be ready. And I remember like the first time I got, um, you know, a headliner gig, the first time I played at a festival, the first time that I, you know, got a residency for Tau Group, which is arguably one of the biggest hospitality groups and definitely has the biggest nightclubs in New York City. When I got all of these things, uh, I, I would message just, him and I'd be like, you're not going to uh, believe this. <laughs> I was just at Tau downtown in New York City recently. Yeah, it's a very cool place. So you know, I'm, I'm, it's crazy how there's certain caveats or certain people that come into your life that um, really make a massive, you know, it changes the path um, that you are on. So I'm definitely very grateful to him still. Well, I hope you return the favor someday to somebody. Yes, I need to. I, mean, I need to pay for really it for is, sure. Yeah, it's incredible uh, to have that happen. How would you describe a Lauren Mayhew set? Okay, so it kind of depends on if I'm playing like a big nightclub at night or if am I playing like a yacht party or day party or rooftop party. It varies a little mm -hmm. bit just based on vibe for that. But I'd say a typical set is very feel good, upbeat, super energetic, um, disco house, um, vocal house, uh, Brazilian bass, like some funk house sort of stuff. I love taking old school songs from like the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s and remixing them to house music. So I feel that Sometimes it can, um, you know, transcend more genres or not more genres, but more um, age groups because, um, you know, people have an accessibility point where even if they don't know, uh, maybe they don't know that song, but it's in a, a version of 2023 that they can, you know, um, appreciate it. Or for 
an older generation, uh, it's maybe lyrics that they know. And so they can, that's kind of their entry point or their connecting point, which is cool. Um, and then I also sing um, when I DJ as well. So it's fun to be able to kind of riff over the songs and harmonize and, um, you know, bring a little bit more, I feel like, you know, bringing some sort of voice um, to the DJ sets. And this maybe sound, sounds weird, but it helps me connect to the audience more because I feel like, you know, when you're watching a DJ, it's one thing to just hear them playing, you know, amazing music, but when they actually speak to you or talk to you and then you hear their voice, like it's, it's really interesting. I've always felt more connected. And so, um, I, I really love the being able to sing part aspect and coordinate that and collaborate it with it. I love that. Are any of your sets online that we can listen? So I have snippets of stuff on my Instagram. I also have some live mixes on SoundCloud. Um, I have maybe, maybe four or five live mixes on there. I actually was doing a live mix a month uh, for some radio stations. Um, I actually probably should um, post all of those now that they've already aired. Um, so maybe this is inspiring me. Maybe I'll go and post a bunch more live yeah, sets for people to have, to but there are some and online. You, and if you come to New York, please let me know. Oh yeah, I'm I'm there literally all the time. I still perform there a ton. So next time I'm there, you got an invite to the show. Uh, I would love that. I would absolutely love that. Um, talk about 2004. You made your feature film debut in Raise Your Voice. You played the arch rival of Hillary Duff's character, um, and and you became very good friends. T talk about that experience. That was amazing, actually. So super crazy in that when I came back for the um, final callbacks. I thought it was just going to be with the producers, but Hillary was actually there, which is not always the case. You don't always get to do a chemistry read um, with whatever leads. Sometimes it's just you by yourself. So um, I was excited, you know, to be able to work with her and to, you know, to play off of her. And I think actually one of the things, and this is crazy, that helped seal the deal um, other than, well, one of the producers said that when I, there's like one scene where I have to be, you know, the typical mean girl and she was like, Lauren, I was afraid of you. And I was like, oh man, I don't know if that's good. I was like, thanks, I think. Um, so there was that. But the other thing was that Hillary, when I first walked in the room, she goes, oh my God, I'm such a fan of your band PYT. She's like, I saw you when you came to Texas. And I was like, that's awesome. I was like, okay. Here I am, like all excited to meet her. And she was telling me that, you know, she was a fan of my previous band. And so I felt incredibly honored and special for that. So um, I'm sure that didn't hurt. <laughs> That's fun. Do you still get that from PYT? Which Sometimes, yeah. I also get re um, recognized from, from Raise Your Voice sometimes um, because a lot of people who I think were around my age, um, it was definitely like a coming of age movie that spoke to a lot of people. So some people will recognize me from that. I think the other thing I get recognized most from is either American Pie Bandcamp or the WWE when I was the ring announcer nationally. I mean, that, there, that, just... that, that whole role I want to get to. But I meant to show this earlier when we were talking about Guiding Light. Wow. This isn't, this isn't a great picture, but there's your granddad uh, played by the late Gil Rogers, who I loved. He was such a great uh, character actor. That's amazing. I, that looks like it was a wedding. I, I wonder if... Yeah, uh, I don't remember even Josh what that got was. Married again. I wonder if your Maybe. parents got married for a I second time. I think they time. did. They got remarried. That's they re-exchanged their vows. That is what it is. Yeah. So I think that was the second. That's possibly their second wedding because they were married three times. Yeah. <laughs> that's so wild. Um, yeah. I mean, W. You know, ring announcer singing the national anthem was WWE something you even knew what it was before. So I did know what it was. I mean, I think you have to live under a rock to have never heard of it, right? You know, so I knew what it was. I knew it was, you know, guys wrestling around in a ring and, you know, with crazy costumes and, you know, um, very glistening, uh, you know, just bathed in body oil, you know. <laughs> um, I actually, I remember I had a uh, a guy friend in like fourth or fifth grade who was obsessed with it and I had a crush on him. So I watched it a couple times, like when we were like, you know, kids, all of us together over at his house or something. Um, but that was really my only entry point to be honest before it. So when I got the audition, this was basically towards the end of college. So most of college, I was acting and singing during my freshman, uh, sophomore, junior year, senior year. I was like, you know what? I just kind of want to, this is my last chance to just do kid stuff and enjoy college life at UCLA. So I'm going to just do that. And then when I graduated, I had, I had a hard time because a lot of agencies or a lot of people would be like, well, you were doing a lot of stuff, but like, what happened to you? I'm like, what do you mean? What happened to me? I went to school. Like nothing happened. I just took a year off. And unfortunately in our industry, more than 
most, I'd say, other industries, it doesn't even really matter what you've done before if it wasn't yesterday. And I learned that the hard way. And so it was really depressing to say the least. And I was, you know, I missed acting in music and I went to school at UCLA. I did all my pre-med prereqs to be a doctor, which my, you know, kind of following up after my family's footsteps. But that was just something that, you know, I wanted to have education, to have education for myself. It wasn't something that I ever thought in my heart I would actually pursue or do. Um, so I was really kind of at a crossroads where I was like, man, I, I need to find an entry point back into what I love. And so when I got this audition, I was like, well, I don't know if this is it, but like, I wasn't going to turn anything down. So I was yeah. like, sure, I'll go on the audition. Cause you never know. So you, you I really went on the audition, which was in LA and they were doing a nationwide search. They were auditioning in every major city, basically like, you know, New York, Chicago, LA, you know, Texas, I, all over. And so I initially auditioned in LA and then I went to a callback and then my final callback, their headquarters were in Connecticut. And so they flew me out to, to Connecticut and it wasn't really until I got there where I realized, wow, this is so much more than just wrestling. Like this is, it really is a whole universe. You know, they do TV, they do films, they have merch, they have, you know, so much stuff that they do. And it was really impressive. And I was like, wow, you know, this could be a really, really cool chapter and opportunity. And sometimes I look at that, especially with a lot of the hosting stuff that I've done in the past, you know, I see certain things in life. Some things are, you know, amazing for your career. And this was also amazing for my career, but other things are just an insane life experience, right? Like what is life if it's not all of these cool, like collectible moments and opportunities, you know, that you get to experience along the way. So for me, I was like, okay, you know, long-term, it's not like my end goal, but I was like, why not? So when I got the call and, and when they said that, I, you know, would you say experience, every experience, you know, is a unique experience and you never know what it presents. I got to ask just randomly, do you know a Scott Zangolini from WWE? I don't think so, but maybe the only reason why I say maybe is because we usually, I usually called most of them by their stage names. So I don't necessarily know. No, no, no. He's not a wrestler. He, he did PR oh. for them. He oh, the no, I don't think so. I think so. Um, yeah. Or no, he didn't do PR for them. I, I can't remember what he did for them. He's a, oh, yeah, it's such friend. a big company. Like there's no way to know everyone. I was only with them for a year. So, but you traveled too. I mean, on top of that. So that was a lot. That was actually the hardest part because I was doing SmackDown as opposed to Raw. I would fly out, uh, take a red eye on a Monday night. I would film on a Tuesday. And then I'd fly back on like the earliest flight on Wednesday so I could be back in town for auditions and stuff. But I was just exhausted. And I felt like, you know, I'd have an audition maybe on a Thursday or Friday and then I'd miss the callback because I'd have to leave on a Monday. And so it kind of got to the point where I was like, man, especially because I lived on the West Coast. If I lived on the East Coast, it would have been a lot easier because for whatever reason, like 60 or no more than that, probably like 70 percent of the shows, if not even a little more, are on the East Coast. There's much less on the West Coast. So I was doing cross-country flights with a three-hour time difference every week. It was a lot. And now you're back in Florida, right? I know, full circle. By the way, if you would have ever told me that I'd be back here, I'd been like, ha-ha, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but, you know, first of all, because, you know, you know, it's, it happened, unfortunately, because of the, the pandemic. But, you know, because the pandemic, Florida really exploded in so many great ways from bars, restaurants, venues, live concert, you know, uh, uh, venues and all of these different places, rooftops, all these things. And, um, you know, Tampa International Airport is amazing. And my family's here. Obviously, the weather is amazing. You know, this is where most people go to vacation. And it's what I call home. So I feel very grateful for that. And when I came back during the pandemic, I kept intending to move back to New York and just get a new uh, new place in Manhattan. And then as time was going on, I realized that all of my additions were on via self tape that, um, you know, I was, you know, near my family, wasn't really missing out on anything with the music stuff. I had to travel all over anyway, so it didn't really matter. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe I, you know, invest here and buy a house because I figured, well, even if I need to move back to New York, I could always sublease it or Airbnb it. Like, you know, this will always be a home base for me. So I went ahead and took the plunge and it's crazy, but, you know, the uh, climate of the industry hasn't really changed in the sense that like, everything still really is mostly self-tape, which is kind of amazing. I think not only 
for casting directors and producers, but also for the talent, because you can actually have a little bit more flexibility and leniency to audition on your own time, to, you know, make sure that you get a tape that you're proud of, um, you know, and also the flexibility to maybe not have to live in just New York or LA, um, you know, and, and trudging into the city if you don't live into the city or, you know, through rain or snow or whatever it is, if you're in Manhattan. I mean, so many times, I mean, I feel like I'll be like hair and makeup ready, ready to go to my audition. And then it's monsooning outside. And it like, you know, it all just goes to crap. And I look like a drowned rat by the time I got there. And I'm like, oh, God, all that work. <laughs> why? I, I think it's actually really fascinating for us as consumers of media and or entertainment. Um, the pool it opens is so much larger. So we're introduced to talent that like I've had some people on my show from like South Carolina, a woman who's a teacher or was a teacher, you know, it just presents an opportunity that when you had to be in person in that room, we didn't get that wide of a, you know, possibility of meeting new talent. That It's very true. I mean, it does definitely on the other side for entertainers make it more competitive Correct. because you're, yes. you're competing against a lot more people. So that is hard, but <clears throat> I'd say it's better overall, you know, because it gives just everyone more flexibility. And half the time I feel like, you know, there is something to be said about not having that um, relationship with the casting director, not having that feedback. You know, I think there is, you know, th that is something that is lost. Um, but I think that a lot of times if it's a large enough role and you're far enough down the line, then they do, require in person or at least a zoom or something like that. So you can get that sort of um, back and forth dialogue and make sure that because sometimes it's so interesting to me how like, you know, I'll bring something to a character and then sometimes a casting director or producer director that's in the room will say what you know, like, what about this? And I'll, it'll be something that I'll be like, wow, I didn't actually even think about it like that way. So sometimes it can be really helpful to kind of bring, you know, new uh, nuance and things like that to the character to life. So you know, I think in that way, it is a little bit of a toss up. But I think that, mm -hmm. you know, if it is a larger character or if it is like a final callback or something like that, then that is a thing, you know, then you can go to in person. But for, you know, initial, you know, calls or auditions or for guest stars or reoccurrings, it really is nice to be able to um, audition from your home. <laughs> I, I, I like that you said that about the casting director, because it is true. And it's it's been said that it's sad that there are no more soaps in New York because of the. um opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with that casting director in the room you know yeah you know and you do learn and you know it's it's a great opportunity and you form a report with them you know i mean there were certain casting directors from when i was younger or a teenager or like even in my 20s that you know they were almost like friends and like some of them that were you know that were rooting for me that were like listen like this is why you're strong for this role like this is what you should focus on and like that's amazing because you know walking to, into some rooms some rooms it's easy that, you know there could be eight, nine, 10 people just sitting there, you know, like watching you. And it's good to know that in that room that you have a fan and someone on your side and someone supporting you. I think that that is incredibly meaningful. Mm. Yeah, that's, it, it is really true. You know, absolutely. Um, you, the fact that you have written as many songs as you have license your own original music to film TV and commercials. Um, how did that begin? you know, what's it like when you're watching something and you hear your music? So um, that kind of started. So after I graduated college, after I graduated from UCLA, you know, I was, I had pretty, I, I guess at this point I had just finished WWE. And in addition to the acting and auditions and stuff I was going, going on, um, I started now because there's so many producers, very, very talented songwriters, et cetera, in LA, I figured it'd be a good time to start, you know, creating some new music. Um, because I'd been out of the music game for a little bit at that point. I'd just been focusing on acting after I had left uh, PYT, after I left the band. Um, so I started writing a ton of music, started meeting a lot of other songwriters, ended up getting a music manager that set me up on, you know, writing sessions where you go in and usually it's a producer and maybe another top line writer, which is what they call someone who writes uh, lyrics and melodies. And you just go into a room. Now, sometimes there'd be uh, what's called a brief um, where they, you know, a different a production company or an artist kind of tells you what they're looking for and you kind of in some references of songs that are maybe some somewhat similar and then you just kind of sit down and try to create the best song that you can in that vein um and i really accumulated a large volume of songs and the thing is it's not every song is going to get you know um even if i mean if you're getting even one song out of 10 or 20 that's hitting like you're doing well you know so i ended up with so much music that i was like man i want to do something with this 
So I started licensing it. I started, I had this unique opportunity because as an actor, so this is the thing, it's really interesting. I always try to find like the road less traveled that, you know, everyone else is not necessarily doing and thinking like, how can I get to that same endpoint, but like not in this congested, like congested, you know, highway, how how can I get in like the the, the express lane? You know what I mean? And so as an actor, uh, most uh, TV shows, films, et cetera, they have what's called a music supervisor. And I'm just saying this obviously for all the fans out there in case you guys don't know. Um, but they end up picking the music and presenting the director with what songs they think would be best for each scene, et cetera. But really most of the time it's the director who has the final say, well, as an actor who's working one-on-one with the director, I would sometimes then say to him, by the way, I also do music and, um, I have a couple songs that I think might be perfect. Would you mind if I sent them to you, if you would give me your email and pretty much every time they said, yes, of course. And, or they would connect me to directly with the music supervisor. Now, If you're a music supervisor and the director is contacting you personally saying, listen to these songs, not only are they going to get listened to, but you probably have a better chance of getting placed because simply just because of that connection. And so I utilized that to my advantage. I started making a list of every single music supervisor that I knew so that when I'd finished new songs, I had my own catalog of people that I could send it out to, um, you know, for their consideration. And in addition to that, I still worked with licensing companies and sync agencies because you can't be a one person you know, band, it's, you know, it takes a village for sure. But um, that, you know, I always try to be entrepreneurial whenever I can. And, you know, try to, like I said, take, you know, take control of my, my future. (laughs) Well, but you are, I mean, you know, you bought your house, right? You know, you're taking control. You can't do that if you're not, you know, earning and, and, and making a living. Um, You have a favorite project that used your song. So it was really cool. So at the time, there was um, a ton of uh, my my songs were being used on all of those MTV VH1 oxygen shows. So I was on um, Dance Moms. Uh, I was on The Hills. Um, I was on like uh, some Paris Hilton like shows, uh, Basketball Wives, all these different types of shows. And what was really cool about a lot of them is that they were actually giving a lot of um, spotlight to the artists by when you'd see like the the skyline of the hills or whatever go by, it would actually say the title of the song and the artist, which was really cool. So instead of just hearing it, people could also know, oh, this is the artist and then go discover them. And they had it, if you went on MTV's website, they, you know, would have like a list of the songs that were played. So it was really cool how they really lifted up musicians at that time and kind of brought them into the forefront, which was such a cool, you know, um, honor and, you know, thing to be able to see. Um, I think, the dance mom's placement was maybe one of the coolest. So I wrote this song <laughs> called Sugar Daddy's Little Girl, which sounds exactly about what it what it's about. It's about just like, a you know, it's like a frivolous, like, a, a, like just kind of tongue in cheek sort of song that's like almost like a Kesha rap sort of song that's okay. like fun yeah. and upbeat about like, you know, just buying all the things and like living the, you know, the high life, et cetera. And they ended up, now you never know when you license a song, like, are they going to use five seconds of it, a minute of it? Is it going to be buried underneath dialogue or is it going to be something super featured? Well, it just so happens that in Dance Moms, they chose that song for them to do dance their final finale number two. So this song was played so much and it was un, 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 uninterrupted for like the whole time that they were doing this performance. So the song ended up unbeknownst to me. People are messaging me and all this stuff being like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, where did you, I didn't even know that it was licensed to this show because I had one company that I worked with where there was some clause in my, my contract where they said that they, cause they licensed so much music that they didn't have to tell you what the show was, which I wish that I had known because I finally found out from just a deluge of fans messaging me about it, but I finally put it up on iTunes and without any other um, promotion, anything else, six months later after it aired, I still sold like 70,000 singles like downloads immediately. And I was like, man, if only I had known and been able to put it up when the show actually released, I could have probably quadrupled that, you know? So it was just such a crazy thing. Um, Yeah. And then I ended up also licensing that same song to a Klondike bar national commercial, which was pretty cool for uh, for Choco Tacos. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you have your hand in so many things. What, what brings you the most joy? Oh, um, you know, they bring me joy for different reasons. I'd say the music, it's such an immediate gratification. You can actually 
feel the energy and relate to the audience because they're right there in front of you. And there's something magical about that. Like there are certain shows that I've had, you know, because no show is the same where, you know, I feel like, oh, I like I have them, you know, like we're on the same page. We're on the same frequency. Like, you know, I could I could play anything right now and like they would get it, you know, and that's such a like such a cool, amazing is feeling. That that electricity. Or, or, or DJing or is that the both? both. Both. I'd say like any, any sort of live performance, stuff like that. And then with the acting stuff, I think what's so magical about that is I love, like I told you, I've, you know, ever since I was little, you know, I've, I've loved being part of a team. And I think that there's something really cool about having all these people who excel and are so amazing in their field come together and create something, you know, such a beautiful story for other people to connect with. And yes, you don't get to see the expression on their faces when they're watching it necessarily, but it's so cool to work with someone and kind of become like a little mini family with them, you know, creating something for months or years or however long it is. And then to see it come to fruition, because, you know, even if you're a lead in the film, there's so much that you're not involved in, um, you know, that other people are slaving away on, you know, and, and doing that, you know, their different jobs. So it, that, that's, really cool in that sector too. So I love that. Um, and then with the hosting stuff, I'd say the hosting has been really cool because I've always been like, I don't know, I've had a voracious appetite for just learning in general. And I feel that hosting has allowed me to delve into these different sectors of, um, I don't know, just uh, cultures and different, you know, kind of climates and stuff like that, where I've gotten to learn about a lot about different people that I don't think I would have ever been exposed to otherwise. And um, to me, like I said, because it's all part of the life journey, I've really enjoyed that. I, I love just learning from people and like their experiences. Like I'm definitely the person who will be on a, a train or plane and, you know, strike up a conversation and, you know, learn something crazy about the person next to me and be like fascinated. So, um, you know, I think that's really intriguing to be able to hear and learn someone's story, which obviously you get because you have a passion for it too. So. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 and it's interesting because I, I didn't realize it until you start doing it more and more and you are. And also, uh, especially through this format, people are learning from, you know, you, you know, just even your ambition or, you know, you willing to try all these things that have led to so many opportunities, enlighten somebody who's possibly watching to do the same. For I mean, I have to say it is, it's not easy and you will get rejected 18 million times, <laughs> but you just have to, um, you know, I think the key is just not being afraid of a no, um, because if you don't try, it's definitely a no, at least if you try, there's a chance it's a yes. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. I talk about it. My mother didn't have a, a you know, a, much of an education because she was a Holocaust survivor, but the one oh, wow. lesson she always taught me was that you know, what's the worst thing they can say to you? And that is no. Yeah. And, it, you know, that it's not going to kill you, that no. But, yeah. what you know, without asking or without trying, what is the worst thing? It's going to be that no. And it's a great right. lesson. It's something, you know. And if you can prepare yourself for that, then there's nothing else. There's nothing worse, right? Like, you know, so then any, anything that turns out better than that is a win. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, before I let you go, I mean, seven seasons to be an animated character on a hit series. Val Thundershock, first of all, greatest name. <laughs> I know. It's so great. I love her. I, like, like, honestly, she's the cutest character. Playing her has been an absolute dream. It's How, another opportunity where who, I've gotten who is to she? Who, who is Val Thundershock? How would you describe her? She is the queen of the rock and roll trolls. And she has spunk and energy and sassiness for days. Um, when she first starts out in the series, you know, she has a lot to learn. I think that she is, um, you know, she, she doesn't see the whole picture. I guess let's put it like that. And Poppy, um, you know, really kind of her friendship with her really brings her out of her shell and, you know, gets her to be um, just honestly a more well-rounded troll. <laughs> I was going to say person, but troll. Um, so it's really cool. You know, I feel like a lot of in an animated show, you know, when it's so amazing now, I feel like, you know, they don't just make them for kids. They make them for adults. And it's amazing that my character is just not this one dimensional character. She's this very real four dimensional character that, you know, has this whole arc and makes, you know, has this whole personality change for the better and goes through struggles and all this stuff. And so um, 
Matt Bean, who was the uh, director and producer and one of the writers on the show, uh, basically I would, DreamWorks would just hire a studio for me wherever I was, whether it was in New York or Florida or whatever. And I would be um, on a Zoom call with them with uh, a couple other people. So maybe some other writers and different people, but he would be the one reading with me. And he just blew my mind how he would always just come up with such great ideas and bring the characters to life. He would always kind of first let me do my thing and see what I just naturally wanted to bring to the character. But um, he's definitely one of those people who, when I, how I'd mentioned before would like surprise me when he would come up with certain ideas where I'd be like, wow, that's good. I was like, okay, let's try that. You know? And that just is such a fun thing to have such a collaborative um, creative relationship with someone that really brings out um, a better performance than you could have done on your own. So. What is it like having an animated character? So one of the coolest things that happened was uh, when they started making her doll. And, uh, you know, I could give, you know, you know, people's friends and stuff like that, the little Val doll. I loved that. That was really cool. Um, and I, I think there's one where if you squeeze her or something like that, my voice comes out, which is so crazy <laughs> and trippy. Um, but, you know, the other reason why it's been so much fun to do is because one DreamWorks is an amazing company, you know, to be a part of and work with. Everything they do is phenomenal. All the other cast are so talented and great. And um, I think that, uh, you know, typically you're it's it's so, you know, stringent in terms of like um, when you have to show up, what your call time is, you know, when all of these different things, but with voiceover, there's a lot of flexibility and it was really cool to be able to do, to still do on camera TV and still do my DJing and all this stuff. And no matter where I was in the world, still be able to do this show. And so um, it's really a cool thing because it's so flexible. I go in my sweatpants. <laughs> <laughs> No um, hair, which is no amazing, makeup. or after I work out, because no one knows. <laughs> All right. So that was a cool, um, you know, extra little bonus, I guess. <laughs> um, what was your animated go-to growing up? Oh my gosh, I still, I gotta be honest with you, I still love animated shows, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I've watched pretty much most of the animated movies, I think, that are out now. Um, goodness, growing up, okay, I loved... I watched a lot of stuff on Nickelodeon for sure. I loved Real Monsters. I loved Doug. I loved, this was not on Nickelodeon, but I watched The Gnomes. I don't remember what that was on, but loved that show too. But yeah, I loved a lot of animated shows when I was a kid. And movies too? Yes, movies too. I'd say probably my, mm, gosh, it's so hard because there's so many good ones now. Um, the whole Monsters, Inc. series is amazing. I love that. I love, um, Gru and the Minions and um, all of those movies. Um, there's so many good ones now. It's crazy. There's one that's kind of like a, uh, I think it's called Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs that didn't get as much press as some of the other ones, but I loved it. Like low key, like such a good animated movie. I, I, feel like, yeah, I don't know why I know that. I, I don't think I've seen it, but I feel like I've heard it. Yeah. It didn't, for whatever reason, it didn't get as much press as like a lot of the other uh, films, but definitely underrated. <laughs> I love that. What's next for you? Um, so now this month, I have a bunch of shows coming up. I have uh, one uh, big show in particular. I'm headlining a New Year's Eve show with a bunch of performers um, here in Tampa at a very cool, trendy hotel called Hotel Haya in Ybor City, which is kind of the more historic neighborhood um, in Tampa. It's like where all the cigar factories and stuff like that used to be. So it's beautiful. It's all like the original brick and things like that. It's very cool. So I'm very excited that um, we're I've actually been working really closely with the hotel to create like a whole experience and with the production team, they're going to build the stage like in the middle of the whole um, downstairs lobby area. So it'll just be this tower so that no matter where you go around it, the entertainment will be kind of happening in like a 360 sort of situation all around it. So I'm really excited. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm actually performing with a live conga player and sax player, like riffing over my DJ set while I sing. So I think that I love being able to kind of fuse the electronic stuff um, with live, um, you know, live performance. I, I, I went to a cool. wedding many years ago, our friend Sam and Scott, who had sort of a conga player with the DJ, which I found absolutely mind blowing. I had it's never really seen fun. it. Until it really, yeah, it really is fun. Um, so yes, I'm really excited about that. And I actually just um, nabbed the opportunity to be the new uh, voice uh, or spokesperson for SeaWorld randomly. So now I just started, uh, I recorded my first thing last week and I have some more that I'm doing uh, this coming week, but doing some 
television, uh, t television commercials and also radio spots uh, for oh, them. So awesome. I'm excited about that. Iconic Sea World. That's pretty. Yeah. pretty Iconic Sea World. <laughs> I mean, going home wasn't a bad idea. I know. So crazy. I know. <laughs> right in my own backyard. Who would have thunk? <laughs> uh, absolutely. You know, so many opportunities. I, I understand the feeling because I lived in New York City for many years and, and came home to New Jersey, which I never thought my husband and I never thought we would do. And yeah. it's the best decision we ever made. So I get that very, 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 very much. Well, so great to catch up with you, Lauren. Thank you so much. Um, continued success. And let me know when you come to New York. I'll, I'll Absolutely. You're definitely invited. I'm so sorry about all the Wi-Fi. I can't believe it, it of all it, times. It, it, it definitely happens. As you said, live, live stuff. Stick here for just a minute. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you to Lauren Mayhew. You can uh, click on the link below for her website and more information about all the great stuff that she's do doing. Join me tomorrow when Emmy Award and WGA winning writer Jamie Giddens joins me live. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And if you like to stream audio versions. Just search The Locker Room on your favorite streaming platform. Have a great evening, everybody. Please stay safe.